Coming up on Tech News Today, PCs flop, Bitcoins burst, and G-Talk unifies. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, April 11th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or online store. Check out their new commerce solution so you can start selling stuff immediately. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT4. And by Hulu Plus. Watch as many TV shows as you want, anytime, anywhere on your devices, all streamed instantly to you. Visit HuluPlus.com slash twit to start your free two-week trial. That's HuluPlus.com slash twit, or visit twit.tv and click the Hulu Plus banner. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zakhar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. IDC and Gartner Group released their Q1 shipment numbers for the global PC market, and it's not pretty. IDC showed a 14% year-over-year decline in global PC shipments, the worst drop since 1994 when IDC began tracking the market. Gartner showed an 11% year-over-year decline, their worst report since Q1 2001. Every region in the world dropped, and Lenovo was the only manufacturer to have gains in both reports. Ouch. The Wall Street Journal reports that Microsoft is developing a smaller version of its Surface tablet that'll launch later this year. Microsoft recently altered the Windows 8 hardware requirements to permit smaller and cheaper screens. The journal also report, reports Microsoft is working on its own phone, but was unclear on plans to bring it to market. During a presentation at the Hack in the Box conference in Amsterdam, security researcher Hugo Tesso detailed that it is possible to misdirect an airplane using an Android app called Planesploit. Tesso was able to feed false navigation information to a simulated jet that he built out of spare jet parts he bought on eBay. He was able to control the steering of the jet while the plane was in autopilot mode. Anyone else absolutely freaked out by this? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I have to say. Uh, how about some chilling effects? Remember yesterday when we talked about Brian K. Vaughn's 12th issue of the Comics Saga being blocked from the Comixology iOS app because it ran afoul of Apple's rules? Well, turns out Apple never blocked it. Comixology just assumed Apple would. And yesterday, after Apple reportedly contacted the company, Comixology apologized and promised it will publish the comic in its iOS app. Saga's Brian K. Vaughn also apologized for being led to believe it was Apple's fault and said he's just glad the whole thing got cleared up. Weird. Very weird. Adam Orth may favor always on connections for video games, but he's now off as a Microsoft employee anyway. The Microsoft Studios creative director who tweeted his opinions on always on devices deal with it, anybody? Remember that? Is no longer a Microsoft employee, according to two sources speaking with Polygon. To potentially end a two-year antitrust investigation, Google formally submitted concessions to the EU after discussions with the EU Antitrust Authority. The EU sought to secure legally binding commitments from Google since Google has a market share of over 80% in that area, according to Comscore. The concessions were not detailed, but a European Commission spokesman says that it will now seek feedback from market players on Google's proposals. Spring is in the air, birds are singing, snow is melting, and CISPA rises from its congressional grave to haunt the Internet again. The cybersecurity law passed the U.S. House last year, then died in the Senate under a threat of a presidential veto. Yesterday, a modified bill passed out of the House Intelligence Committee and is expected to reach a House vote next week. CISPA would protect private companies from liability when sharing data with the U.S. government in order to combat cybercrime. Critics say it doesn't include sufficient and privacy protections. TechCrunch reports leaders from Facebook, Google, and others announced that they're forming a political advocacy group called Forward.us, FWD.us. The group plans to promote policies that will keep the American workforce competitive. The group's first priority is pushing for comprehensive immigration reform, but will also support education reform and scientific research. 
I've always thought the Samsung Galaxy Note needed a better name for its large size, but <laughs> it seems Samsung was reserving that better name for an even bigger phone. Meet the Samsung Galaxy Mega. Comes in a 5.8 inch and 6.3 inch model, which Samsung hilariously claims can still fit in your pocket. So buy on the baggy side. The Mega comes with an unspecified HD display. We think it's probably 720. 1.7 gigahertz processor, Android 4.2 LTE capability, 8 or 16 gigabyte storage options, and an 8 megapixel camera. Samsung did announce a price, but it is coming to Europe and Russia in May. I bet Kim.com is going to buy a thousand of them. Yeah. Want, to, want to know when you get your eyes behind some Google Glass? Well, wonder no more. More. If you're a part of the Google Glass Explorer program, you'll get the device within the next month. That's the official word from Google itself. Glass Explorer Edition owners must pick up their devices in New York, Los Angeles, or San Francisco. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, and now an online store. I use Squarespace to sell my books and now I can do a store. I can actually sell physical books because you can do digital or physical books right out of your Squarespace site. You still get those mobile responsive designs. You still get the uh, the fact that they'll you upload one image. They'll resize it seven different ways so it looks right on all the platforms. Uh, you get their 24-7 customer support, that great legendary reliability. And Squarespace Commerce provides a powerful and flexible e-commerce solution now integrated to work with every Squarespace template, allowing sales for both physical and digital goods. For example, you could sell your music CDs or your MP3s. Fast merchant account setup so you can accept payments right away and a single interface for order management, tracking orders, providing customer updates, printing shipping labels, adding coupons, all that stuff's included. Squarespace Commerce is included with a business plan subscription, which starts at $24 per month when you sign up for a year, or it's $30 for the monthly plan. And like I said, best mobile experience, better social media integration, exceptionally well-designed. It's award-winning design. That could be yours. You could have an award-winning design on your site. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform integrating with all your website needs, domains, design, development, commerce, hosting, and 24-7 customer support. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com, sign up for a free account, no credit card needed. Just try it out, start building your website. Then, if you decide to purchase it, use offer code TNT4 and get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. That includes the monthly or the annual plans. And don't forget about free domain registration for annual plan subscriptions. At squarespace.com, use that offer code TNT4. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss some of these stories we've been talking about is Lindsay Turrentine, editor in chief of CNET Reviews. How's it going, Lindsay? Hi, going well. Good to have you back on the show. It's great to see you guys. Uh, I wish we had better news for the PC market to start off with, though. I know. It's wah, wah. It is, right? It is sad trombone all over. I mean, there is. I, we heard the numbers mostly in the news fuse. Uh, nothing good here. Worst quarter since tracking began for IDC in 1994. Uh, worst quarter since Q1 2001 for Gartner. Uh, Samsung saw some Chromebook sales continue to grow. Uh, Apple... Dropped 7.5% in IDC's report, but they rose 7.4% in Gartner's report. That's the only major discrepancy here. Otherwise, they pretty much agree. HP dropped 24%. Uh, Lenovo saw some increase, as I mentioned before. IDC blames the Windows 8 user interface, missing the start button, costly touch screens, people not liking that. Uh, basically saying people are looking at Windows 8 and saying, I see no reason to upgrade, and I see some reasons not to bother training people with this new interface. Tracy Rothenberger, COO of Rico, uh, which updates about a third of their 17,000 units uh, every year or so, said, I don't think there's anything wrong with Windows 8, but I think there's minimal value and incremental changes that are there. Now, Gartner says, eh, it's probably less Windows 8. It's more just the rise of smartphones and tablets. Lindsay, what what do you think is is at the root of this? We thought Windows 8 might give a little boost uh, back to PC sales, and it certainly has not. No, I think I think there are a few things going on. I think people are afraid of Windows 8 because it looks so different. But I think that you know, if Windows 8 had come even three years ago, there might have been more willingness to try it. I think this kind of points to the commoditization of computers. I mean, people have set expectations of computers now. They do more and more of their work on the web. It's interesting that Chromebooks are on the rise right now, despite Windows 8 sales going poorly, right? I think expectations for what happens on your laptop have just leveled off and people don't feel like spending a bunch of money on something that they're afraid they won't even understand. 
even though, you know, I feel like most people, once they actually use a Windows 8 laptop and are shown how to use it, are like, okay, that's fine. I as do you agree. You think it's a little bit of apathy of people going like, yeah, it's fine, but I don't really see the point. Well, I was looking at the study, and the fact is that it seems like tablet usage is taking away usage from your laptop. The thing is, if you're using your phone or you're using your tablet or using this this primary device all the time, you're less likely to go, hey, my laptop's really slow. I'm going to run to that application that I have on my phone instead. And I think that since effectively a lot of people have become two device people. They have their laptop or their desktop, and they still have a phone. And that primary device becoming the phone or the tablet will pull away from your usage of your laptop. And you're thinking, okay, well, I don't need to learn something new, nor do I need to upgrade because this thing's working fine, and I'm going to get a new phone in two years anyway. So why bother upgrading my laptop? Yeah, and Sarah, as long as your laptop, it, like, opens right up, gets started, and um, is relatively light for most people, I think that's really what they want. It's all about the form factor, and if they already have it, then... It's yeah, I, I, I agree with all of this. I think... I, you, Particularly for me, I mean, recently I kind of had a funny moment where I had to PayPal somebody and I was on my laptop and I'm like, where's my phone? I need my phone. I got to PayPal somebody. <laughs> you know, and I sort of thought like, how ridiculous is that? But it's like, I've sort of been trained to, I've got, I've got alternative ways to get things done. My laptop that I, I'm using right now, I've been using for years. It's slow. It's awful. And instead of getting a new one, I can kind of just work around the problem that I have right now. And I, I think that for, for a lot of folks, um, and, and Windows 8 is, I think the, part of it is the fact that Windows 8 is different enough so it's kept certain people away that are uh, familiar and, and, and prefer the, the Windows interface. But in general, it's just a shift in the, in the devices and, and demand. Yeah, that's what uh, Web0009 in the chat room says. Like, come on, it comes a time when sales just slow down. And, and I think that's part of it is laptops and, and PCs especially are, are a mature market. And I'm, I'm like you, Sarah, like sometimes I'll use my phone while I'm waiting for something to load or waiting for the beach ball <laughs> to go away or, or waiting for the little hourglass to stop flipping because I'm like, oh, I have this other computer I can use for something here. More often, I'm going back to the laptop to do something that I just can't do or can't do easily on a tablet or a phone. But I also don't feel pressure to upgrade my computer the way I used to. It used to be every 12 months, I'd start to feel the pinch or every 18 months. Now, I've had this thing for over, uh, I think over two years now, uh, and it, it's still working. So that may be all there is to it. The, 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 the hardware inside your computer may not need to be replaced so often. Let's uh, move on to uh, how you're going to pay for all of these devices in the future. <laughs> Bitcoin. But uh, is, the, is, is the market crashing? Yeah, I don't know if you're going to want to pay for anything with Bitcoin uh, because <laughs> it's really, really volatile. It's kind of an interesting story. You may have heard the word Bitcoin um, all over the news, especially over the last week. Yesterday, um, the, the, the price of Bitcoin basically crashed. It had quintupled in price over the past 30 days on an exchange called Mt. Gox. It's MT period Gox. Uh, went from 265 earlier today. That's you know a conversion to to uh, to US dollars to 150. So a huge, huge, huge drop. Another exchange called Trade Hill said the reason that the currency is falling is because they're experiencing a DDoS attack. That basically a bunch of people are are trying to to bring down Mt. Gox and then have a bunch of people freak out, the price plummets, and then you can buy a bunch of Bitcoin. So it's, it's, it's basically gaming the system in a way. Mt. Gox said on a Facebook page, no, 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 it wasn't an attack. What it was was too much interest in Bitcoin and our infrastructure just needs to grow to be able to handle it. They said a uh, volume of new users caused a lag, people panicked, and that's why uh, they sold off the currency and that's why we saw a price drop uh, specifically Mt. Gox says 60,000 new accounts were opened in the first few days of April. You compare that to the entire month of March, which was 75,000 accounts. I say, listen, at, at this rate, 20,000 accounts being being added every day, we need to uh, to to take our servers offline and and maybe add a couple new servers to to make sure that we're growing um, with the demand. Some people are calling BS on that whole thing, saying that's it shouldn't be that hard. This is just uh, you're trying to sweep under the rug the fact that there. There are denial of service attacks that make the whole Bitcoin idea really, really unstable. Tom, I know you've actually, you've got some Bitcoins. You've been following uh, their rise and fall in the marketplace. What do, what do you make of what's going on here? 
Yeah, I got a bunch back in February 2011. It wasn't when it launched, but it was like first kind of erupting into the the tech space's consciousness. A, a nice listener that I cannot remember gave me a bunch at the time when they were worth virtually nothing. And I, I also got a couple for like downloading a program, doing a thing like that. So I've been tracking this lately. Uh, when I started paying attention again to Mt. Gox, I think they were worth about $60 a piece. And then they went up above 100 and then they were up 180. And then I saw this story and I'm not checking in constantly. And I actually don't keep the Bitcoins in Mt. Gox either. Uh, and I saw the story that it had burst and I went back and I looked and it was still at 180. So I think what happened is essentially it just, it had a big bubble that burst really quickly. Uh, and, and that makes sense. You're in the very early days of a type of currency that I don't think anybody can really properly define yet, but seems to be getting traction. And during those, that early part, it's going to get tested to see if it can actually withstand things. And, and this seems to be normal activity. It, it, if it went up too fast, then that should pop and it should bring it back down. The fact that it's still, you know, it's back up to around $180 to me is kind of surprising. Well, then again, Mt. Gox this morning was not letting me trade even if I want to wanted to buy Bitcoins because the whole thing was so volatile. So, Lindsay, I mean, when you when you come across this whole, this whole Bitcoin idea is, is, is unregulated and that scares a lot of people, is it going to just because this is the way economics work, end up falling into the same patterns as traditional markets? I would assume so. I mean, the interesting thing about this is that even if even if they're adding, I don't know, 200,000 investors a month or more, that's not very many people if you compare it to the number of people trading on even a small exchange in a small country. Uh, so I would assume that over time, as people buy Bitcoin, if that continues, then things will level off and there will be ups and downs, but not bubbles that can grow and burst within the space of a week, uh, which is kind of what's going on here. And it, it's it, it's a little bit strange. I don't quite buy the we're adding that many users so fast uh, because I assume that they employ people who have worked in the financial sector before. And those people are pretty careful about designing systems. My husband used to work on those systems and uh, there are a lot of best practices that prevent against that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, it'll be really interesting to watch. I actually wonder if this, you know, supposed collapse of Bitcoin is the best advertising because people will pay attention to it all of a sudden. Ayaz, what do you think? It's it's an interesting idea of looking at currency fluctuations. I mean, when you're thinking about different countries and their, their currency fluctuating based on stability of government or other economic uh, downturns that will determine what that value is. In this case, it's if these places can stay online. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a denial of service attack or it's a denial of service because they're just being hit by too much traffic, they're still the, the result is the same. The infrastructure is getting hit, kind of like a government. So it's just to even put this together in this modern world to see internet currency working this way. That's intriguing to me. But I, this is this is currency. Currency fluctuates. So the 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 fact that it's fluctuating so wildly has people freaked out but it's very similar to uh, a currency that would be in a nation that's not exactly stable yet yeah. the worst thing for a currency would be not to be used not to be speculated upon not not to be traded so i actually am a little shocked that two years down the road we're still talking about bitcoin and its usage is increasing i think it's something very curious to watch i'm still not convinced that it's going to catch on Certainly, I'm, I'm not convinced at all that it's going to replace any any global currency like the euro or the dollar. Uh, but it's got a lot more traction than than I might have expected. So. Well, we, we need more places to accept bitcoins. You know, I mean, that's I think that's that's the major issue, right? Someone in chat was like, "Well, what can you buy with bitcoins?" Well, not enough, or else it would be actually a more viable uh, 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 unit of currency. And right now, it actually seems like some sort of strange mutual fund. It's just an investment vehicle yeah. because you can't spend it, right? So you can invest in it, but it's all based on a market of speculation unless you have a reason to use Bitcoin all the time, which most people don't. Yeah, there's Silk Road, which is controversial, that takes it. WordPress takes it. Reddit takes it. I mean, it's limited, the number yeah. of places that take it. But the fact, again, I go back to the fact that anybody is taking it at all. I, I... I find very intriguing, very interesting. I feel like Bitcoin will find some sort of niche or something. You know, there'll, there'll be some some specialized use for it over time, and then that may be what causes it to become widely acceptable. And and apparently, I didn't realize this. The chat room's telling me we take it as a donation currency here at Twit. So there you go. 
Uh, let's uh, let's talk about something that is probably as real as Bitcoin. Microsoft's next Xbox. Yeah. The <laughs> What's the rumor about that? I asked. okay. The Verge reporting that the next Xbox will control your cable box. Now they're citing multiple unnamed sources, and they're saying the next Xbox will have an HDMI pass through similar to Google TV, and that that's going to allow Microsoft to place an overlay UI on top of existing TV channels. And this is apparently supposed to be a key part of the next generation Xbox, whatever that means. Since Microsoft has partnerships with a lot of content partners, content providers, that is, the Xbox would be able to go much further than Google TV was able to. And there's some more info on the Xbox. It requires an always-on connection when you want to use these entertainment services. And the next generation Connect apparently will also play a role in how you watch TV. The next Connect will actually detect multiple people and their eyes and will pause content when a viewer turns their head away from their TV. Kind of like the Samsung Galaxy S4. Lindsay, do you think this whole cable box uh, HDMI thing is going to be a selling point for the Xbox? I think it depends on how they handle what the feature set that goes along with that is. I mean, it's very important to Xbox, certainly. We know that now, I think, well, the last time I heard the statistic more than half of Xbox usage is now as a set-top box, is entertainment rather than gaming. So Xbox is really well positioned to become the central box for your living room, and it already is for a whole bunch of people. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. If there's some really interesting implementation of that interaction or the overlay with your cable, uh, maybe some social element where you're watching with friends. That doesn't seem compelling enough to me, though. So maybe my imagination is not able to predict what they're going to do with it. <laughs> I, I haven't. I, I can't think of a really compelling use for that yet. But we'll see. I mean, Xbox has really been working hard on those content partnerships. Um, they've been going out and working with a lot of different entertainment houses to make sure that they have really great titles available on Xbox. Um, so maybe there's some special use there that, that we don't know about yet. Tom, do you think Microsoft can out-Google TV Google? Well, that wouldn't be very hard right now, would it? <laughs> <laughs> there's not much not much of a Google TV user base out there, but I think they're definitely trying. Uh, and their, their, their leg up on Google is that they have the cooperation of the cable companies in this. So they, they can integrate with those boxes and, and they can provide a different interface. Uh, and when you get to that interface, I'm like, Lindsay, I'm not sure. I'm a little curious what it's going to look like. Now, granted... Xbox has done some excellent interface work stuff. So let's not just bash Microsoft because they don't always do great interfaces. Uh, the the Xbox 360 television interface is actually really good. I, I I think they've done some some great work and they've improved it over time. So maybe if they actually take over the interface from the cable companies, which don't have a reputation for very good interfaces at all, this could be a big improvement in how I find shows, where I find shows. I could get that ability to just say, I want to watch this show, and Xbox could tell me, oh, it's on Netflix, it's on Hulu, it's live, it's on demand from your cable provider, it's on HBO Go, all those different places there. That could be pretty interesting. I'm a little skeptical that because they have to integrate with my cable box, uh, that it's going to be as smooth, or they're going to be allowed to do it as smoothly as they should to help the user because there's so many entertainment industry interests that, that get in the way of that. So what do you make of the idea that Connect's going to start watching you? And if you turn your head, they're going to pause the content for you. It's funny. That's that's exactly what I'm a little bit hung up on. I, I don't know what my problem is when it comes to, like, you know, tracking my eyes and blinking and, and you know, being able to, being able to control uh, interface uh, via uh, a camera face. and visuals. However, the Connect in general when it works it works really really well um at least with 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 my limited <laughs> uh testing of of the system so i kind of i kind of see this and i go no you turn your head away you don't necessarily want it to pause because the system isn't smart enough to know why you might have done that i mean maybe you're looking away because it's like a i don't know a violent scene in a in a show or there could be all sorts of reasons you know or you're talking to your friend or i'm not really sure but even though i think it sounds clunky it's also kind of exciting. Um, I hope that there, there are, they are going to try this, and I hope there is a lot more experimentation as far as making your cable interface better because right now, none of them are very good. If Microsoft's Connect can watch you and then give metrics back to those content partners to say, hey, look, your ads are working. People are watching your ads. Mm. That could be really interesting for them so they can actually get more and more content uh, providers to be on board. And as for the, the, the pass-through concept, I'm thinking if you like gaming, the thing about the Xbox, the next one, because of a processor shift, at least that's widely rumored, 
it shouldn't be able to support the 360 games. So if you have a 360, I would think you'd be able to plug it into your new Xbox, and they would all kind of work together so you don't, you don't really lose anything. It might be a little added bonus for people to go, oh, yeah, if you still want to use your old Xbox 360, you can. You just have to run it through this device as well. You can have a giant stack of Xboxes. Xbox In your media console, right? You could have, like... Well, there are also yeah. the rumors that there could be a small Xbox and a big Xbox, right? The right. big gaming Xbox and then a mini one that basically competes with Roku and has all of that set-top functionality and then possibly, I think you're right, Tom, you know, if they can get show search down and make good product recommendations, um, you know, or good show recommendations, they'll be golden. Yeah, I was listening to Paul Throt on, on What the Tech, and he was talking about the, the 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 dual Xbox situation. Apparently, the Xbox 360 is going to be ninety nine dollars, and that's going to be the Roku competitor because that thing's staying around, and they're not going to have two next gen Xboxes. It's going to be one old gen refresh and one new one, and that I think would be, really be serious trouble for something like Roku. 360 in the bedroom, all that kind of thing. That's interesting. Very interesting <laughs> idea. All right, uh, we got to take a quick break and thank our other sponsor, Leo Laporte's going to pop in and tell you about him. Hey, have you tried Hulu Plus yet? Oh, I love Hulu Plus. It's a way that you can, uh, it's good. It's great for cord cutters, but even for people, in fact, somebody in the chat room is saying, I just use it as my DVR. Uh, it is a way to watch unlimited instant streaming of your current hit TV shows, your classic series, great movies, and it's on almost everything. It's on, of course, many smart TVs, but also Blu-ray players, gaming consoles, the PS3, the Xbox 360. It's on Apple TV. They have a beautiful Hulu Plus interface. The Roku. Mobile phones, tablets. And you start watching on your Android device. Then you get home. You start watching on your Roku. It's going to pick up right where you left off. $7.99 a month with limited advertising. You cancel at any time. But you can get two weeks free right now if you go to HuluPlus.com slash twit. Not, not Hulu.com, but HuluPlus.com. Slash twit or visit our website. If you go to twit.tv, the banner at the bottom of the page, click that link. You'll get the same deal. Two weeks free of Hulu Plus. Um, a great way. Yeah, right there. Two weeks free. That's double the normal uh, the normal deal. Really great stuff on Hulu Plus. And it it should be part of your overall cord cutting strategy, my friends. <laughs> HuluPlus.com slash twit or visit the website. Click the banner and uh, and get get going with Hulu Plus today. All right, let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity. CISPA is back. The uh, the internet is starting to rouse itself again, at least in certain quarters. Uh, and I think what a lot of people want to know is, okay, what is this? Because it's not as objectionable as SOPA, at least to some people. Uh, the the internet world is split. There are a lot of tech companies who support CISPA. Significantly, Microsoft and Facebook oppose CISPA, but Google's been on the fence. In, in fact, Alexis Ohanian from Reddit called Larry Page. Uh, I think he had to leave a message, but he was asking Google to please come out in opposition of CISPA. Now, what it wants to do is make it easier for private companies to share information with the government when combating cyber criminals. And on the face of it, most people say that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's a lot of liability involved with sharing information that that should should be allowed. It should you should be protected if you're only using it to get the bad guys. But that's where this becomes a problem. How do we make sure that the government uses this only to go after criminals and not to spy on people or ha or use the NSA as a blanket uh, for for just doing whatever they want with the data? They've added a couple of amendments. One amendment requires the government to remove personal info from cyber threat data. Uh, that means the government gets the data, then removes the personal info. There was another amendment that required the private companies to remove it before they sent it to the government. That amendment got denied. Another provision uh, removed some vague language that allowed for a broad use of data for national security purposes, so they tightened up the definition a little bit. Uh, there were other amendments that did not pass, though. One uh, would have uh, specifically excluded the Defense Department and the NSA. That did not get added. Uh, another would create a supervisory post to oversee this and make sure that the data was handled properly. That did not get added. Now, as we mentioned in the news news, House takes it up next week. We don't know what the White House is going to do this time around. They haven't said. In fact, they haven't even responded to the anti-CISPA petition, which got 100,000 signatures at whitehouse.gov. Uh, if you had had to handicap this, Lindsay, uh, what do you think? Uh, when it heads to the House floor next week, where, where do you think this is headed? 
I feel like, I mean, I am no policy expert, but I feel that it will probably pass. And this is the kind of thing that, well, I don't feel like Congress has shown a lot of um, interest, <laughs> I guess, in protecting privacy as it pertains to the internet, partially because of, you know, the series of tubes attitude, right? There, there's still a lot of lack of understanding about what could happen or what the potential privacy concerns are. That's just a gut feeling, though. And, and, and the problem is with info sharing. How, how likely is it? I mean, we've seen that the, the committee, the intelligence committee, behind closed doors, by the way, so it's actually a little hard to figure out exactly what got added and what got changed yet. Uh, but they, they haven't quieted all of the objections to this IS. Do you think they can craft a bill that does that? Is that even possible? I don't think that's possible with any bill, quite honestly. Uh, bills, when, it, it, when, you, when you draft them and you revise them and you revise them and revise them, uh, no matter how well you, you, you have your intentions, no matter how well you've carefully chosen your words, there's always some kind of gaming of the system, and that's why the courts are the backstop when it comes to this. So uh, as much as, as this as CISPA should be paid attention to and as the revisions and amendments come through, uh, there's always going to be opposition to everything, and there's always going to be loopholes to something because somebody's going to outthink the text. It just usually happens. So I, I'm just thinking that we should be paying attention to this, and, and hopefully the concerns will be allayed because people will, will bring this up and there'll be comments publicly all the time. The, uh, the, the cat signal has already gone out. That was created after SOPA last time. But you don't have Google behind it. You don't have the big guns behind it like you did in anti-SOPA. Sarah, do you, do you think that the outrage will rise to that level? Well, I hate to think that uh, this is one of those situations where everyone remembers SOPA and everybody changed their avatars and it was... It was it, it, there was there was really good outreach and then a subsequently outrage about the whole thing and that you just can't rally the troops again so soon afterwards for it you know for what many people have a hard time understanding you know what goes on in government and all of the stuff and it's the house and it's a bill and uh, is the White House uh, you know going to veto this this is a lot of stuff that you know th these are details that 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 can be hard for people to wrap their heads around. Um, you know, maybe I watch too much House of Cards these days, you know, but I look at this and I'm really pessimistic that the right things, you know, are passing for the right reasons. Uh, and, and yeah, this is the sort of thing that, like Lindsay said, it might pass just because it's kind of like an apathetic attitude, at least on the part of, I don't know, a company like Google. Google's seems like it's like a part-time business of Google's to make sure that they're really involved in things like this and take a really, really strong stance uh, for reasons that not only help Google, but but their whole philosophy. And the fact that they, ha they haven't gotten involved yet is kind of speaks volumes to me. CISPA failed last time for two reasons. One, it was in the wake of SOPA, so there was still a lot of anger uh, towards regulation of the internet simmering. And the White House came out and said, we will veto this if you pass it. Uh, that essentially killed it in the Senate. We don't know what the White House is going to do yet. That's going to make a big difference. And we don't know what Google's going to do. I think that also is going to make a big difference here. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Meanwhile, in, in, in a more lighthearted uh, piece of news. Uh, we've seen some more leaked screenshots of Babbel. What is Babbel, Ayos? Google Babbel is supposed to be this one unified messaging service that takes over all of those, or, or will get rid of all the other Google Talk Messenger and every other thing that they have, Hangouts. Uh, Tech Radar grabs some screenshots of Google Babbel. They're saying their source is new, but the, claim, the source claims he or she works for Google. So you take this with a grain of salt. These are literally pictures of a screen. Somebody took a camera and took pictures of a screen, and uh, it's pretty much a flat Google design. Instead of text, you have boxes around uh, your, your, your actual t your conversation, kind of like chat bubbles. The service itself. Now, Droid Life got a, a bunch of details. They claim they got their hands on a Google memo, and it's saying that Babbel would actually combine Google Talk, Hangouts, and Messenger with voice integration to come later. Google Voice would not be integrated at launch. Uh, there would be a desktop app, a Chrome app, an Android app, and a, whatever this means, first-class iOS experience. Notifi <laughs> notifications would be synced as well. So if you get notifications on every single device, once you check on your desktop, every other notification goes away because that makes a lot of sense. Why wouldn't that work? Uh, and then also messages will include more text, more than 800 emoji options. Sarah, I'm going to ask you first, are you excited for all the kittens? Because when I saw the screenshots, I saw pictures of cats in the emojis. 800, over 800 of these. Yes. 
Yes, in a word. <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, I, lo I love this idea. This, is, this sounds a lot like what messages or iMessage, depending on what device you're on, if you use um, Apple's crap. Spectacular. Yeah. Mm, gosh, don't even get me started. But no, this I, I love the idea if uh, you can get a message on a variety of devices, but if you check it somewhere, then it disappears in other places so you don't have all of this, you know, it, uh, a bunch of messages that you've, that you've already seen in too many places. I don't know. This sounds good. I do a lot of chatting. I, I, I welcome it, certainly on the iOS experience. I don't know what first class iOS means. Maybe better than what Apple can make as a native alternative. That's a, that could be a quick little dig at Apple. Sounds kind of like what it means. Lindsay, what do you make of this uh, this possible combination of all the messaging un uh, this universe here? Well, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, Google has been pushing Google Plus, and the fact that this is going to integrate more into Google Plus sounds very googly. It sounds very much like what they've been trying to do recently. And it's funny because at CNET, we were just recently sort of talking as a group about the various messaging platforms that we all use to communicate with each other all day long. A lot of us use Google Chat because um, because we use Gmail, and a lot of us still don't think it's quite where we want it to be. It doesn't have all the functionality of some of the sort of even some of the older school, you know, Trillion style shared chat um, programs. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement. This is a good start, although <laughs> I have never in my life used an animated or uh, illustrated emoticon in Google <laughs> Chat because maybe I'm the world's most boring person, but um, this it's kind of hilarious. I, to me, it's like, okay, great. And they really want to make sure that they capture the like 12 year old. Tom, chat. are you are you nervous at all about Google Voice not being there at launch, at least in, in this in these reports? Is, is Google Voice kind of going the Google Reader way? I have I, I absolutely no opinion about this whatsoever, to be frank. I already thought this is the way it worked for you know whenever i get a, a g talk message a gmail it shows up in google plus i guess what they're adding is the the mobile aspect of it so you can have an app messenger that also integrates uh but yeah i i guess sure google voice come would come to this i i assume that people who really use this across all platforms are going to be very excited for it so out of confusion you have you have apathy that's great i but I, I'm actually very excited about this because I was confused and I want all this stuff to work together because I'm sick and tired of downloading six apps to do one thing. Well, maybe you can explain to me what doesn't work together right now. I don't think you, it's how you start Hangouts doesn't work in every single thing. Google Talk just added the ability to do Hangouts. Google Voice and, and Talk don't talk together. Google Docs chat doesn't talk to Google Talk. So there's a whole bunch of them that don't work together right now. I kind of don't want Google Docs chat to, to talk to Google Talk. That that seems like something that should be separate because it's specific to that doc. Well, silence, but I, I get the other stuff. Silence is golden. All right. It seems like you should be able to leap out of that into Google Talk faster, though. I mean, if you want us to be like, let's, it's kind of like saying, let's take this email conversation to the phone. You know, it's just going to be more efficient. Yeah, no, I guess that, that makes sense. Let's finish up with uh, some Foursquare news. They've got millions of dollars, Sarah. What are they going to do with them? Yeah, $41 million. It's pretty much to invest in, I don't know if you'd call it a pivot for the company, but definitely a refocus in how the company can make money. Iaz and I are still using Foursquare on a regular basis, mm -hmm. but I don't know about a lot of other folks. Um, I, 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 I know in, in my Foursquare feed of where my friends are, it has really, really dwindled from what was it, 2008 or 2009 when Foursquare launched um, to, to much fanfare and people saying, oh, it's going to be the next Twitter. And a lot of folks saying, yeah, Foursquare, nobody really wants to become mayor of a place anymore. Checking in is, that's old, that's over. The interesting thing is that Foursquare has merchants that it works with. So I might see a special um, if I search for a coffee shop, uh, for example. The problem is, is that's somewhat buried and Foursquare realizes they're just not uh, making making use of the merchant uh, agreements that they can have. So this summer, they're going to let all of the merchants uh, that Foursquare works with, and they've got, I mean, uh, uh, many, many, many merchants um, rather than uh, the, than the 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 merchants that they have agreements with already to highlight search function and 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 any merchant to be able to say yes I'm I'm going to agree to pay Foursquare a little bit of money and have some sort of a special that gets highlighted. What's interesting about this is that um, Stephen Rosenblatt, who's the Foursquare chief revenue officer, says, for example, if I get sent an ad from a nearby coffee shop after I search for a latte on Foursquare, 
as far as the data that they have. Between 3 and 5% of the time, I will click on the ad and visit the shop within 72 hours. So that's that's a really, really good uh, percentage um, if you compare it to, you know, maybe ad clicking you know, on websites in general. They also have, Foursquare has a ton of data, and that's not just within their own app, because over 40,000 other apps have built in Foursquare's platform into their app rather than build their own location databases. So this is Foursquare pretty much saying, we now have, you know, data collected from Path, from 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 Vine, from Instagram. I mean, and there are millions, millions of users. So a new revenue sharing deal with Visa and MasterCard allows people to upload their credit card information to get discounts. This is Foursquare basically saying, we want to make money off of specials. I mean, it's you can almost think of it as a Groupon model that's just so much more geolocated and allows Foursquare to employ far, far fewer salespeople. I mean, thousands and thousands of salespeople fewer because it's an algorithm that works pretty well based on our activity. I, as this obviously still requires me to be checking in regularly because that's where you're building the data for mm -hmm. where if you search for that coffee shop, you see that a friend has checked in and that that's all built in. Does this make sense for Foursquare, you think? I think so, especially about that point you mentioned, how Foursquare is being used in so many other different applications. Uh, it's not that I go to Foursquare necessarily to check in. I want to see the specials or explore things. It's, I'm using something like Untapped so I can log the beers I'm drinking. And then there's a little Foursquare integration. I'm doing it on a path. I can do that Foursquare integration. And that'll take me either to the app or I'll actually start looking at the application more. It keeps it in my mind anyway to actually click that Foursquare icon. So I think as long as they're everywhere and that they're the, lo the location database for a lot of these other applications, you do remember them. They still have a presence. You're not thinking about Go Wallet when Facebook bought them. You're not thinking about these other competing services. I don't think when you think of check-in services, you think of anything but Foursquare at this point, uh, including even Facebook's own check-in system. So I think once they have this in place, once they, they keep these partnerships in place, I think they're going to still be doing quite well because they have pretty much the biggest game in the market. Lindsay, just... They, oh, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. I think that they... Uh, I think that they have to change people's behavior a little bit, right? And so this might be a good opportunity to get people to check in because they want to find out if there are any current deals, right? Rather than to check in because they're showing off to their friends, which that seems to be over, more or less. Um, you know, so you just kind of like, okay, I'm at Starbucks and wait, before I walk in the door, I'm just gonna check, see what's going on at Starbucks. And that could be pretty compelling, I think, even beyond the sort of coffee shop model, if you get to big, box merchandisers or instead of having to go through a circular or get coupons in the mail or even an email, um, you just find out whether there's something going on when you walk in the door. I think there's a lot of potential there. Tom, what do you think? Uh, I mean, this this to me sounds like, I mean, Foursquare and Yelp have already been competitors and they have a lot of the same feature sets. But more and more, I do go to Foursquare, especially if I'm in an unfamiliar city or something to just kind of see what's around. Do you think that uh, having more specials for places that I've never been before, or maybe haven't been in a while, is going to help? Uh, is going to is going to help me make make that sale and and give Foursquare a little bit more coin? It can't hurt. Uh, the other thing I would do is I would I would encourage the stores to put up signage because uh, frankly I see these specials a lot of times. And I just don't use them because I'm like, ah, these these people aren't going to know what this is. You know, this restaurant doesn't show any sign that they know Foursquare. And I've had that conversation with people before where I'm like, do you honor this? It's half the time they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. And, and a lot of times I get people like, oh, let me check with my manager. I don't really know what that is. So I, I, I think there needs to be a little push from the other side to make this work. Yeah. Let's move on to the randomizer. Uh, this coming from a woman in Georgia who was turning the corner and saw something flying at her. It struck her bumper. She pulled over and found an iPad. Launched <laughs> Free iPad. Uh, How does that happen? <laughs> they used a hammer to dislodge it, and the iPad not only survived, but still contained enough uh, juice and, and operational capability for them to find the owner's name and telephone number. I guess the guy had left it on top of his car when he drove away, and it just oh. went flying out. <laughs> okay. wow. And Gosh, into that. a bumper? Well, yeah. I mean, it what, lodged right in there, too. How it fast was, was it flying to do that? Relative well, speed. Well, it does show I mean, you how aerodynamic the shape of the iPad is. It's, it's really, it's really thin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's pretty heavy. Bumper. Next it's gen heavy. iPad. 
razor thin, cut through so cars. Thin. It'll they should have right kept it there. <laughs> Just keep it there, right? Like, turn on the camera and drive around for a little bit. See what ha- There's something there for the car companies. Yeah, the camera's actually is visible in there. It's on the bottom, but you could you could actually do it, I guess. And, the, and, the, and the, that means the dock connector's on the top. You could probably rig this. I think Lindsay's onto something. Opportunity lost. Mm-hmm. So sad. I dropped an iPad on my toe once. I'm surprised I kept the toe now. <laughs> Let's see what's on the calendar. Not much, huh, Sarah? <laughs> Not much. Uh, T-Mobile USA is going to start selling that iPhone tomorrow, April 12th, which is my half birthday. Hmm. Happy half oh. birthday tomorrow. Well, Happy that's ha- tomorrow. That's what I said yeah. tomorrow. Okay. All right, let's see what's incoming. <laughs> incoming message. We got a message from Wes. He says, hey, TNT crew, I'm a cord cutter without the time to watch live TV, and I gave up torrenting years ago. If it's not on Netflix, Hulu Plus, or Amazon Prime, I don't watch it. That said, if Aereo came to my area, I would absolutely return to watching shows from the major networks. While I don't represent most consumers, Aereo could be future-proofing for a market that is moving away from live TV. Add in some viewing metrics from Aereo, and suddenly, the major networks are more capable of delivering high-quality content to a large audience. Their need to control distribution is throwing away a huge opportunity. Thanks, guys. You know, I don't think it is. I, I, I understand why the broadcast networks are afraid of Aereo. And it's si- simply because right now they make the majority of their money from cable, from going after retransmission fees. They make money off of advertising, granted, but they don't. if they went to an 100% over the free over-the-air broadcast model, uh, that would not end up well for them. Uh, so I... I, I think I get why they, they want to resist this change because they want to be in charge of that transition. They want to come out with their own uh, over-the-internet models and they want to control the prices. Uh, whether they should be fighting that out in court or not, well, you know, that's that that's what you do. You, you see if you can win in court. What I don't want them to do is change the laws of the country to favor a business model. But I do, I do, I do think it's easy to go like, yeah, but they make money over the air. It's been a long time since broadcast networks were able to fund their entire entire operation over the ad from the advertising. Those, those those fees make up a larger and larger amount of the budget all the time. All right. Well, that is it for this episode of uh, Tech News Today. Lindsay Turrentine, thank you so much uh, for joining us. What's happening over there at CNET.com? Oh, it's a it's a beautiful day here. We are uh, we're talking a lot of T-Mobile, getting ready for reviewing some GS4 in the future. Exciting stuff. Good stuff. Check it out always. And always good to have you, Lindsay. Thank you. Love being here. Thanks uh, for submitting in our subreddit to all those people who do. we got over 15,000 people in there. Technewstoday.reddit.com letting us know, hey, these are the stories we're interested in. These are the stories we're not interested in. You can vote them up, vote them down, get in there, and uh, let us know what you think. You can also find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. It's Friday tomorrow. That means Darren Kitchen from Hack 5. We'll see you then.